If you have your Bibles, why don't you go ahead and grab them and make your way to 1 Peter chapter 5. And that'll be the last time that I'll say grab your Bibles and turn to 1 Peter. This is our last, our last sermon in 1 Peter um, after about six months. Hope you guys have enjoyed the time in, in, in this book as we've just uh, dived deep into the truths of God. Um, I love it. We, we talked about this in men's group a little bit, and the guys kind of joke with me a little bit um, because we spent three weeks reading Ephesians chapter 1. Um, but man, I love just going slow. I love diving deep into the text and really understanding the context and understanding the original meaning and the application for us. Um, and even just like radiant diamonds, uh, that's what we have in God's word, that, that we can turn it and we can see different things in different seasons of our life that are still true for us. And so 1 Peter chapter 5, as you're turning there, I want to remind you, as always, that you are holding the word of God, which is true and it's for you. And it is your sword. If you were here last week that James talked about, it is the weapon that God has given you um, for the battle. That is this life. Um, this life is difficult, right? We've been talking about that over and over in First Peter as we've seen the, the struggles, um, the hardships that Peter has said that we will face. But God has given us a weapon, and it's his word. And so that's why we open up the word every week. That's why we, um, we dive deeply into it, because we want to arm ourselves with the truth of God's word. Um, okay, so First Peter chapter 5. We, we just got three verses today. Um, last time... Two weeks ago what was really kind of the the main closing of Peter's letter all right when we looked at uh, what was it I think it was we did like 6 through 11 a couple weeks ago um, that was really Peter's big exhortation to us that in light of everything that we've seen in this book in light of the five chapters that we've been going through methodically um, he said there's there's three virtues that I want you to pursue you guys remember what they are it's been a little while. We can be interactive today, or you guys might just not know. You might not remember. Humility, uh, vigilance, and faithfulness. In the midst of all that is this life, in the midst of the difficulties of this life, in the midst of knowing who you are and whose you are, um, we are to be men and women of resolve who are vigilant. We're to be men and women who are faithful to the calling that God has placed on our lives and we're to be men and women who are humble. And that was really kind of the grand finale of this letter, but we still have these three verses remaining, verses 12 through 14. And if I'm honest with you, a lot of commentators don't really pay a whole lot of attention to these verses. It was kind of hard for me to find a whole lot on these verses. Um, but as I was kind of mapping out this sermon series, I didn't just want to lump these together with the passage from last time because um, there's some important things in here for us. Um, in these three word, in these three verses, it looks like just a, a final greeting, like, "Hey, you know, love you guys, bless you guys. Here's some other people that are thinking about you. You know, stand firm, and we'll see you real soon." Uh, but upon closer examination, there are some really important components for us to consider. And really, these are this is God's word, right? Like, like if we say that God's word, this is all God's word, then I think it's all useful, and I think there's um, opportunity for us to be instructed and to glean from everything in. Here. Okay, so this, this sermon might be a little bit different, um, but I, I guess what I would ask of you is just to try to track with me a little bit because we're going we're gonna to kind of run around a little bit. We'll spend some time here. We'll spend some time in Acts, but I believe that it will all, we'll put a bow on it at the end of it, and it'll all come together the way that I believe God would have it come together for us this morning. And so let's go ahead and, and stand and read this passage. 1 Peter chapter 5. 12 through 14. Peter says, By Silvanus, a faithful brother as I regard him, I have written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. She who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings, and so does Mark, my son. Greet one another with a holy or greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. You may have a seat. 
So before Peter rolls this up and puts a seal on it and sends it out for delivery, he has these final words for us, this final greeting. And in verse 12, uh, we really see this is why I've written, right? If, so kind of if you just want a, a general synopsis for what is the reason for this book, he says, I've written to you briefly, and, and maybe that's even comical right there. I was thinking this week as I was reading that, I'm like, some of these guys aren't going to think it's too brief because we've been in here for like six months, right? I think this is, ver I think I wrote it down, 23 weeks, 23 weeks that we've been in this letter. But compared to a lot of the writings of Paul, this is one of the briefer epistles. Um, 105 verses, I believe. He says, I've written to you briefly, here's why, to exhort you and to declare that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. Stand firm. Okay, so if he can leave you with any one exhortation, it's to stand firm in the true grace of God. Again, James talked about this last week in Ephesians chapter 6 as he dug through the armor of God over and over. It says that we are to stand firm. We've been equipped so that we can stand firm, so that we can withstand the arrows, the fiery arrows of the enemy. Um, and after we've done all that we can do, it says stand firm, like over and over, right? That's the command for us as believers. That we are to be men and women of resolve who are, who are planted firmly in the true grace of God. And that word grace is an interesting word, and it's, I don't think it's an accident that he uses it here right at the end. You guys know what grace, how would you define grace? Anyone? Getting what you don't deserve. Okay, grace is simply getting what you don't deserve. And I don't think it's an accident that Peter uses that here because this whole passage, this whole letter has been about suffering, right? He's writing to Christians who are persecuted. He's writing to Christians who are dispersed all across the region. And a lot of them are probably thinking, man, what is this? This is not what I deserve. I didn't do anything to, to deserve this. Like this is not, I've searched myself. This is not a result of my sin. This is just like people being ugly. This is people persecuting me. This is the result of me living in a sinful land. I don't deserve this. What's going on? And I love that Peter drops this in here to remind them, you know what else you don't deserve? Salvation. You know what else you don't deserve, Christian? The love of God. You know what else you don't deserve is God pursuing you even in your sin and redeeming you and rescuing you and forgiving you. That's what you don't deserve. And that's the word for us this morning. That's the gospel message of Jesus, that he's given us what we don't deserve. He's extended grace to us. What do we deserve? Like, let's just say it. We deserve hell. The wages of our sin, what we have earned for ourselves, is hell. Eternal separation from God. Forever. Um, so, this word grace, obviously the, the mega theme of 1 Peter is suffering, right? We've talked about that over and over and over again. But I would submit to you that another theme of 1 Peter is grace. It's an underlying theme, and it's kind of a subliminal theme, but there's eight times in these five chapters that Peter reminds us of God's grace. Um, he starts off the letter in, in chapter 1, verse 2. He says, May grace be multiplied to you. Um, in, ch in, in chapter 1, verse 10, he says, The prophets prophesied about this salvation grace that was to be yours. In verse 13, he says, Set your hope fully on this grace. In chapter 3, he says, you are heirs of grace. In chapter 4, he says, be a good steward of God's grace. In chapter 5, he says, God gives grace to the humble. And what we saw last time in chapter 5, he says that after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. And then we have it again here that we are to stand firm in the true grace of God. He's reminding us subliminally almost to remember and to focus on what we have received that we don't deserve. It's easy for us in the midst of struggles, in the midst of difficulties to just kind of be navel gazers and just kind of feel sorry for ourselves and to really focus on our circumstances. And man, this just stinks, man. And, and, and Peter's saying, well, remember what else you got that you didn't deserve. Focus on that. 
Remind yourself of that. Church, we have to remind one another of that. Because we are prone to wander, our minds are prone to be selfless and to be pitiful. And that's why we need one another to remind each other of the great precious gift that God has given us in the grace of Christ. Um, he says, stand firm. Right? This is, this is the big exhortation here at the end. In the midst of unjust suffering, stand firm. Don't waver from your faith. Um, in the midst of the trials of this life, don't be, as, as Paul says, don't be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Stand firm. Um, in the midst of the storms of this life, don't be, as James says, don't be like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. Stand firm. Stand firm in the truth. This last exhortation, I really believe, applies to everything else that we've learned previously in his letter. Right? Stand firm, knowing that even though the world may be against you, God is for you. Stand firm, knowing that though the world may persecute you, though the world may attack you, though the world may even kill you, stand firm because they cannot steal your eternal security. They can't steal your eternal freedom. Stand firm knowing that you have hope for a future glory, uh, uh, an inheritance that's imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, which God is keeping for you in heaven. Stand firm knowing that God doesn't waste your suffering. God doesn't waste your suffering, Christian. He's not unaware. It's not that something happened to you that He didn't see coming. He has allowed it all. Oftentimes, He orchestrates it. Why? So that He can work in you in the midst of suffering, so that He can sanctify you, so that He can um, mature you in your faith and have you grow more dependent upon Him. God is working in a thousand different ways behind the scenes in the midst of the difficulties of this life. Therefore, stand firm. Uh, stand firm knowing that we have a perfect example of what it looks like to suffer for righteousness sake, right? We saw that here in 1 Peter. We have the example of Christ. And as we share in the sufferings of Christ, we will also share in His glory. And then stand firm by humbling yourself under the mighty hand of God, knowing that at the proper time, He will exalt you. He will lift you up. Stand firm, Christian. Stand firm. And then Peter says something interesting in verses 13 and 14. He says, She who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings, and so does Mark, my son. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Now that last verse, greet one another with a kiss of love, is something that most Christians don't do anymore. Um, but I think it's something that we should talk about. It's, it's here, it's in Scripture, it's a command. Right. But um, obviously, I don't No one kissed me this morning. I haven't kissed anyone. I'm not, I haven't seen anyone kiss each other. Um, but it's important. Right. That's part of God's word. And that was a part of church history for a long time until about the 13th century when the church got legalistic and the church is like, man, that's that's gay. <laughs> right. Like like because because if if a guy kisses another guy on the cheek, that has homosexual overtones. Right. We don't want to. Or if a guy kisses another girl on the cheek, you know, that could have that could have sexual overtones that we like. We just we don't want to do that anymore. We're uncomfortable with that. And so <laughs> and so the, the 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 holy kiss was replaced with a hug. And then that was kind of replaced with the, the side hug. You guys know the church side hug? And then that's been replaced with a handshake. And then COVID hit, and we just try to stay away from each other. Yeah, fist bump, maybe elbow bump, right? A holy elbow bump. Um, but I think it's important what Peter's after here is that there's something important about how we greet one another, and there's something important by greeting one, one another physically. <sighs> Um, there's something important by how we show affection to one another and show it physically. All right, you guys have you guys have seen the studies of like babies that you know are are held well and touched well, and then orphans that aren't touched that well, and what it does to them physically, mentally, and physiologically, psychologically. Um, so it is with us. There there should be something within us where where we demonstrate our affection. Like that's why you know we we hold hands to pray, or we you know put a put a hand over someone's shoulder and pray for. 
for them, uh, give each other a hug or whatever it is, because that's saying, hey, I see you and I love you. Right? That, I mean, I don't want to go too far down this bunny trail. I'll probably say something I shouldn't. I guess I already did that. <laughs> um, but it's important, right? This is God's word. And so I think it is important that, that we uh, communicate and that we demonstrate our affection to one another in ways that are appropriate. Um, so he, he gives a group of people and an individual who sends their greetings to these churches. He says, she who is at Babylon, and then he talks about Mark, his son. And so she who is at Babylon, th there's some different thoughts on what this means. I think most theologians, and I would, I would agree with this, is that, is that what Peter is talking about here is he's talking about the church at Rome when he says, she who is at Babylon. Um, she, the, the church, ecclesia, is a feminine uh, word, and so it's often used with a feminine pronoun, she. Um, but Babylon, what a lot of people think, was a code word or a cryptic word for the church at Rome. Uh, Peter was writing from Rome, and oftentimes during heavy persecution, uh, writers would exercise extreme caution and care so as not to endanger Christians by identifying them. Right? And we see it even today, like in missionaries that are in overseas and third world countries. Um, oftentimes, you know, if someone's talking about them or giving an update about them, they're using a different name or they're not identifying their exact location, especially online, because they don't want people to find out, hey, we got we got a Christian here. We got a missionary here. We need to seek him out and destroy him. So a lot of people think that this uh, church or she who is at Babylon is just referring to the Roman church, the believers who are at churches in Rome. Um, and I believe what Peter's after here by saying that this church is greeting you is more than just what we would think like, well, that's just a common, unusual greeting, right? Like, hey, you know, you talk to someone on the phone, you're like, hey, my friend says hi or whatever, right? I think there's something more to it. I think what Peter's after here is he wants these early Christians to know that they are not alone. Um, and in essence, I believe that's the message for us today. Have you ever been in a place where you're like, man, I just feel lonely. I feel like no one gets it. I feel like no one is experiencing what I'm experiencing. I feel like I'm going through this and I'm navigating things and no one knows what's going on and no one's been here and no one can help me. And Peter's like, you're not alone. There's millions of other Christians who are going through the same thing as you. There's millions of other Christians throughout all of history that have navigated the same difficulties and sufferings of this life that that we're navigating now, you're not alone. Um, that should cause us to have a little bit of confidence, a little bit more peace in what we're going through. And we talked about that last week, right? That one of the, one of the snares, or a couple of weeks ago, one of the, well, you probably talked about it also last week. One of the snares of the enemy, or one of the um, methods of the enemy is to isolate us, to get us alone, to get us to feel like there's no one that can understand, there's no one that can help. I'm out here by myself. And it's just not true, and that's what Peter reminds us of here. Um, and then he talks about Mark, my son. This is not his actual son. This is like Paul talking about Timothy as his spiritual son. Peter is talking about Mark as his spiritual son. And this Mark guy is actually an interesting case study. Um, most biblical scholars believe that this was the same Mark that was introduced to us in the book of Acts. Um, some theologians believe that Mark was, was among the 3,000 people that heard Peter preaching on the day of Pentecost and repented and put their faith in Jesus. Uh, but regardless of when Mark joined the early church, he became involved pretty quickly. Uh, we see in Acts chapter 12, you guys might remember this story that uh, Peter, our, our author here, was imprisoned and there was a group of believers that were gathered in a home praying for him. You remember that? God, would you deliver him? Would you keep him safe? Would you help him? Would you give him uh, confidence? And, and so Peter, miraculously, he, he, God releases him from jail and he goes to this home and he knocks on the door and you remember, I think it was Rhoda, the, the house girl goes and she's like, who is it? He's like, it's Peter. And she gets all excited. She's like, and she runs in the other room and she's like, hey, it sounds like Peter's out there, like the guy we're praying for. And they're all like, Rhoda, stop. We're, we're trying to pray here, <laughs> right? But then she goes back. He's like, you can open up the door and 
she, he opens up the door and there's Peter. Uh, that house was the house of Mark. That was his parents' house that they were gathered at praying in. That was in Acts chapter 12. And then the very next chapter, in Acts chapter 13, Paul and Barnabas uh, head off on their first missionary journey, and they bring Mark, John Mark, with them. Um, this guy has, you know, he's, an, he's, he's still a young believer, but he's established himself to be trustworthy. He's established himself to be useful. And Paul and Barnabas are like, hey, you come with us. We're, we're going out. We're going we're gonna to see some churches and hopefully minister and evangelize. Come with us. Um, unfortunately, it turns out that Mark did not stay with them for very long. In Acts chapter 13, uh, just a few verses later, Acts 13, 13, it says, Now Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga and Pamphylia, and John left them and returned to Jerusalem. Okay? John Mark deserted Paul and Barnabas in the middle of their journey, maybe even towards the beginning of the journey. The Bible doesn't say exactly why, um, but we could speculate, and it might be a justified speculation to say that he got worn out and he got discouraged, and he said, I can't do this any longer. See, it was shortly after their, their stay in Cyprus, uh, which was mostly a, a fruitless visit. There wasn't a whole lot um, that they were writing back about what God did in Cyprus. There's a little bit of ministry, but um, there was a lot of opposition in that city, even, even demonic oppression. And shortly after that is when Mark leaves. He got discouraged, and he decided to return home to the comforts of his previous life. And so, why don't you go ahead and turn, I want you to see this, turn to Acts chapter 15. Okay, after, after the first missionary journey, Paul and Barnabas return back to Antioch, which is kind of their headquarters. And after a little while, Paul starts to get the itch. He's like, man, let's go do that again. That was exciting, and that was terrifying, and yeah, all, all the rest, but we need to go. God is calling us. Let's go, Barnabas. And this is what happens. Look at, look at Acts chapter 15, verse 36. It says, and after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. Now Barnabas wanted to take with them John, called Mark, but Paul thought best not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to do the rest of the work. And there arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commanded by the brothers to the grace of the Lord, and he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Okay, so Paul and Barnabas have a disagreement, and it's about Mark. It's about John Mark. Barnabas is like, bro, that's my cousin, man. Like, let's, he's, you know, he's young. Like, let's take him back with us. And Paul's like, I don't want him, man. I don't want him. He was, he's, he's not fit for what we're trying to do. It's so much that there is a sharp disagreement that they're like, all right, peace. We'll go our separate ways. And Barnabas uh, took his cousin, uh, John Mark, and sailed off. And Paul took Silas and went in the different direction. And this is the last time in the book of Acts that we hear about Barnabas and Mark. The, the narrative follows the story of Paul. And we see that God worked mightily through the missionary efforts of Paul. But years later, this John Mark enters back into the picture. Um, years later, we see in the book of Philemon that it appears that Mark is back with Paul again because Paul says that Mark is a fellow worker. Um, and then at the end of Paul's life, Paul's writing to Timothy, and Paul sends a request to Timothy, and he says, Get John Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. It's interesting, right? The guy that, that Paul was so adamant, like, I don't want that guy with me, now he's asking Timothy to bring that guy to me because he's useful. Paul or uh, uh, John Mark had obviously matured in his faith throughout the years. 
He learned from his mistakes. He repented of his faithlessness. And God continued to use him. Um, he teamed back up with Paul at the end of Paul's life. And now we see that he teamed up with Peter. And that Peter is calling him my spiritual son. This would have had to have been an encouragement to Peter's audience. And it should be an encouragement to us as well. That regardless of what you may have done in your past, regardless of how many times you may have failed, or that you may have shown yourself to be faithless, even as a Christian, maybe you look back and you're like, man, I, don't, I was following Jesus and I don't know why I made that decision. Like it was like surely God is not, you know, he's done with me like, like Paul was done with Mark. And what Peter is trying to demonstrate here is that God is a God of second chances. And God is a God of third chances and fourth chances. Why? Because God is a God of grace. The true grace, which we stand firm in and we cling to, because that's what God demonstrates to us. And Peter is saying, don't believe the lie that you're no longer useful. Don't believe the lie of the enemy that because of what you've done, God's had enough of you. Like, quit trying to enter back in or to apologize or to be useful again. No, God's done with you. You've messed up, son. He's done. That's a lie of the enemy. And this is what Peter's trying to demonstrate by bringing Mark's name into this. Um... Mark went on not only to be useful to Paul and not only to be the spiritual son of Peter, but he went on to write the most succinct gospel presentation of Jesus. This guy is the author of the Gospel of Mark. Um, a lot of people think that the, the Gospel of Mark is really the Gospel of Peter, um, that Peter was, as, as the spiritual father of Mark, that Peter was giving him kind of the play-by-play -play as Peter was with Jesus, right? Giving him the first-hand account for, for Mark to record. But because Mark remained faithful and because Mark didn't believe the lie that he was washed up and that he was not useful anymore, God used him mightily to change the world through his writing. He stood firm. He stood firm. He learned from his mistakes. He repented, and God used him. There's another individual at the end of 1 Peter that Peter mentions, and his name is Silvanus. Right? We saw that in verse 12. He says, By Silvanus, a faithful brother as I regard him, I have written briefly to you. Um, Silvanus was most likely the um, secretary for Peter as he's writing this letter. He probably wrote it as Peter orally uh, dictated it to him. He was probably also the delivery man who took uh, this letter to the churches that we saw in chapter 1, verse 1, uh, to, the, to the Christians in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia. He was probably the delivery man. And he delivers this letter, and they're reading it as he's standing there. And at the end, they see, hey, this Sylvanus guy is a faithful brother. Um, and I think, I'm guessing that a lot of the Christians in the early church were probably like, yeah, I know. I know Sylvanus. I've heard about Sylvanus. I've heard what he's done. I've, I've heard the stories of how faithful he's been. I can't believe he's standing right here with us and, and you know, probably uh, stayed and ministered to some of these churches even more. That's why Peter's like, hey, he's a faithful brother. He can trust him. Do you guys remember Sylvanus? Sylvanus is actually the same guy as Silas. Sylvanus is the Latin name for the Greek name of Silas. This is the same guy that we were just reading about. This was the replacement for Barnabas. And so go ahead and, and look back in Acts chapter 16. Let me do this real quick. Some of you guys are probably going to hate this, but some of you guys maybe geek out, geek out about this kind of stuff and, and would like this. But you might say, well, how do you know that it's the same guy? How do you know that Sylvanus, this Sylvanus is the same Silas? Well, let's prove it. All right. Uh, Acts chapter 16. 
Look at 1 through 5. Acts 16 says, Paul came also to Derbe and to Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. Uh, he was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. And they went on their way through the cities. They delivered to them for observance the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith as they increased in numbers daily. All right, so this is right after what we read last time in chapter 15 that Paul and Silas took off and then Paul and Silas come to Derby and Lystra and they join forces with a guy named Timothy and then soon after that they they pick up a guy named Luke who's actually writing Acts and so the four of them are navigating most of this second missionary journey through uh, the second missionary journey of Paul all right now look at 2nd Corinthians you don't have to flip there Mason put that up real quick I'm not gonna flip there either all right, Corinth was one of the places that these guys went to and they ministered to. Later, Paul is writing this letter, and Paul says, uh, For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, whom we proclaim to you when we were with you, Silvanus and Timothy and I. Right? Mason, flip over to 1 Thessalonians 1. They also visited Thessalonica. And then later, uh, Paul is writing back to this church, and he introduces the authors as himself, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church. In, Thessal uh, in Thessalonica, in God the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. This is Silas, and this is the same guy that Peter is writing about now, Silvanus. Um, and so I want to, and this is where I said we're going on a little bit. You guys still, you guys still with me? And I'm taking you around, but we're going to tie it up. All right. Um, look at look at Acts chapter 16. Um, an incredible story when these men are traveling on the second missionary journey and they cross over from Asia into Europe and they land in a little city named Philippi. Uh, there's no believers there and so these men are going around in the synagogue and teaching about Jesus and sharing the gospel message about Jesus and there is an incredible story that happens in Acts chapter 16. Uh, look at verse well, let me, let me give you some, some context, all right? Uh, Paul and Silas and the guys are there. They're trying to minister. There's this little girl that's following them around who's demon-possessed, and she's being really annoying. Uh, she's like, hey, these guys are, are, are servants of the Most High God, and he, she's just following them around for days. And it says here that Peter or Paul gets really annoyed. He's like, man, I'm sick of this. Like, I've been trying to be patient. But he turns to this little girl, and he's like, in the name of Jesus Christ, get out of her. And he, he exercises a demon from this little girl. Now, the owners of this girl are upset because they've been profiting off of her. People have been coming to her for her to tell them their fortune. All right, It's like this wicked divination type thing where people are coming, paying the, the owners of this girl to spend some time with her. And now the owners, as you might imagine, are upset because Paul's driven out the demon. Right, which is like their source of income. And so it says that, that they're upset and they start making allegations that this, these men are disturbing our city. All right, that's where we're going to pick it up. Look at verse 22. Acts chapter 16, verse 22. It said, Then the crowds joined in in attacking them, and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. Verse 25. All right, hang with me. We got like 10 more verses, but I want you guys to see this. All right. Verse 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that all the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, Do not, do not harm yourself, for we are all still here. And the jailer called for the lights to be turned on, and he rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said to them, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? 
And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. And he, bap and he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into the house and set food before them. And he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. I love this story. It's an incredible story. And I can only imagine that some of Peter's audience knew this story. Like, man, this is the brother that we heard about. This is the brother that was with Paul. This is the guy who, like, w was kind of the opposite of Mark, right? Where Mark deserted Paul, uh, Silvanus, Silas stayed by his side through thick and thin. Uh, when, when, when Paul was beat, Silas was beat. When Paul was imprisoned, Silas was imprisoned. But here's what I want you to see in this story. Um, it says in verse 25 that Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns and everybody was listening to them. Just imagine that. Imagine if you are wrongly imprisoned, what are you going to be doing? Like they had every right to be griping and complaining and belly aching and yelling, hey, get us out of here. We haven't done anything wrong. Like we're Roman citizens. This is illegal for you to have us in here. This is insane. But instead, they just trusted God and they prayed and they sang hymns and other people heard them, including the jailer. And the jailer asks them, ultimately, hey, what do I have to do to have what you guys have? There's something different about what's going on in your lives. Do you think that he would have asked them that if they were belly aching? If they were complaining the whole time? Like, do you think it was the miracle of God that broke the chains and flung open the doors that caused that man to want what they had? Or do you think it was the joy and the confidence and the courage and the peace and the hope that Paul and Silas had within them, even in the midst of a dark hour. And Peter's talked about that, right? Like we, we, we've talked about this all throughout the book of First Peter, that, that as a Christian, life's going to be hard. There's going to be difficulties. Don't, see, don't, don't be surprised when the fiery trial comes upon you. But the way that you respond is important. All right, there's an onlooking world who knows that you are a Christian and they're looking at you, observing you to see how it is that you're going to respond. And the way that you should respond is with the truth of God's word, knowing that you are his, knowing that you have hope, knowing how the story ends, knowing that nothing can separate you from his love. I don't think it's a coincidence that Peter decides to use these two men by name as he closes out his letter. John Mark and Sylvanus, two very different men with two very different stories who both ultimately stood firm in the true grace of God and ended up, really, I don't think this is overstating it, ended up changing the entire course of human history. Because you remember when, when Paul and Silas left uh, Philippi, they had a small group of believers. You remember Lydia and this jailer? There was a small group of believers. They left a church. Um, this was the first church of Jesus Christ in, uh, in Europe. Right? They crossed over from Asia, and all of a sudden the gospel is spreading across the globe. We see the kingdom of God expanding. Why? Because men were faithful. Because men stood firm in, in their faith. Because men understood the grace of God. And so let me just take it a step further. Maybe this goes without saying, but, but what's the application? Like the same is true for you? 
There's nothing special about Mark. Like, that dude was a failure, right? Nothing special about Silas. He was a sinner. Um, but they were committed to the Lord. They entrusted themselves to the Lord. They knew that God could use them they knew that they didn't have to get their act together so that God could use them. The, this glorious grace that we're talking about, the truth of the grace is a, is a transformative grace that saves you and then changes you. And as it's changing you, God continues to use you as you are. And that's how God still works today in the lives of His people, in the lives of you and, and in my life as well, that God desires to use His people to accomplish His purposes to carry out His good plans. Um, stand firm. Stand firm. He ends His letter, Peace to all of you who are in Christ. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. Again, this kind of seems common, normal, usual. It's the way that you know Paul used this kind of language all the time. Um, but I think it's important. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. Um, he knows that he's writing to a bunch of Christians who are suffering. He knows that he's writing to a bunch of Christians that are um, wrongly persecuted for their faith. He knows that he's writing to a bunch of Christians who are looking for peace in their lives. And he's like, hey, peace can only be found in Christ. Peace to you who are in Christ. There's a lot of people who are looking for peace even today, especially today. Man, the last two years have have torn up a lot of people. Um, and there's a lot of people that are looking for comfort and looking for peace. And there's a lot of people last night that spent the night at the bar trying to find peace from the bottle. And there's a lot of people that probably popped all sorts of pills last night and fell asleep just trying to fall asleep so that they didn't have to think about everything else in their life anymore because they just so desperately wanted some kind of peace. But if they wake up today without Christ, then they will never experience true peace. True peace can only be found through the Prince of Peace. And we have that. It doesn't mean that everything's always going to be calm. It doesn't mean that, that there's not going to be times that are difficult and times that are painful and times that are confusing and frustrating. But if you belong to God, then you are co-heirs with Christ, the Prince of Peace. And you can stand firm in the true grace of God, regardless of what you're going through, knowing that you are united to the Prince of Peace. And so let's go ahead and pray now to Him. Uh, Father, man, first of all, we just were, what a privilege it is to, to spend six months um, walking through your inspired text um, to dive deeply into to submit ourselves to your word and to to um, be transformed to sometimes get our toes stepped on a little bit to be encouraged as well father we thank you for your word we thank you that it is uh, life for us um, Father, in light of this text today, Father, I ask that you would, um, that you would help us stand firm. Um, Father, all, all that we've learned throughout this passage, that, that you might help us uh, recall to our minds at the time that we need it, that we need the promises, that we need the truths of your word. And Father, you've promised us that life's going to be hard. Don't necessarily like that promise, but appreciate the heads up. Um, but Father, you've also promised us that we can stand firm. And Lord, we ask that you would help us. Um, Father, we ask that, that we would stand in the truth of your word and we would stand in the true grace of what it is that Christ has done for us. And Father, that as we do, that we would have peace even in the midst of difficult times. Um, even as Paul wrote back to that church at Philippi, encouraging them to stand firm and that the peace of God, which, which transcends all understanding, would guard their hearts and their minds. Father, we ask the same for us, that that peace would penetrate our hearts and our minds. 
and that we would go about living this life that you have called us to live with confidence, with courage, and with hope for the future, and that we would be used by you to spread the message of this glorious grace. In the name of Jesus, amen.